Hello and welcome. I'm Reem Hussain, Chief Planning Officer at Azar Asset Management. Our topic today is all about taxes. I'm confident you will benefit from the information we provide you today, but first let's get the disclaimers out of the way. This discussion is not meant as one-size-fits-all investment advice or any account type or recommendation for any particular security. We highly recommend that you speak to your financial advisor, tax professional, or attorney for information specific to your situation. Before we begin, let's look at today's agenda. We will first look at the two major tax types, what the tax rates are this year, and discuss the three tax buckets. We will then move on to cover the four most common mistakes that may result in getting an IRS notice. And finally, I will share with you how your tax return can uncover planning strategies that could help you to keep your lifetime tax liability as low as possible. It's important to understand that different kinds of income are taxed differently by the IRS. Two of the major distinctions are between ordinary income tax and capital gains tax. We will discuss capital gains taxes in the next slide. Ordinary income tax applies to the income you earn from working on your wages, salaries, and commissions. It also applies to the interest earned on bank deposits. Our federal income tax system uses marginal tax approach. This means that tax gets higher as income increases. Taxpayers may find it confusing to figure out how much tax they owe because different slices of income are subject to different tax rates. The current tax system uses seven income brackets that go from 10% to 37% with each rate being applied to income in the associated bracket. Another point of confusion for many taxpayers is the difference between your marginal tax rate versus your effective tax rate. Both are used for tax planning purposes, but for 95% for taxpayers, the effective tax rate is the better tool to use. It is the actual percentage of taxes you owe on all your taxable income. It is worth mentioning that the rate applied to the trust and states is different. Trusts reach the highest federal marginal income rate at much lower threshold than individual taxpayers, and therefore generally pay higher income taxes. A trust is subject to 37% rate after reaching only $15,200 of income. This seven rate structure is scheduled to automatically phase out on January 1, 2026. The second major type of taxes are called capital gains taxes. These taxes you owe when you sell an asset such as stock or mutual fund and you realize a profit or capital gain from it. Taxes are determined by your income level and how long you held the investment before you sold it. Here's what capital gain tax rate look like for 2024. And in this table, we focus on long-term capital gains. These are investments held for longer than one year. The highest earning taxpayers pay a 20% tax rate on long-term capital gains, and those in the lower brackets will pay either 15% or 0%, depends on their incomes. Please note that these tax rates do not include any applicable state taxes. And as a reminder, you must hold the security for at least 12 months to qualify for long-term capital gain treatment. On the other hand, short-term capital gains investments held for a year or less that are taxed at your ordinary income tax rates. One side note before we leave this slide, ordinary dividends are treated as ordinary income. Qualified dividends are subject to the same 0%, 15%, 20% tax rate that applies to the long-term capital gains. Understanding how your income and investments are taxed brings us to discussing the three different tax buckets. While we cannot avoid paying taxes, you can choose when you want to pay them. These three tax buckets are essential for saving, especially when it's come to saving for retirement. The first tax bucket or the taxable bucket is tax me now bucket. As you invest, you are taxed along the way. You pay taxes on these accounts annually, you fund them with an after-tax money, and you do not receive a tax deduction for them. Each year, you get a 1099 form to report the growth or loss in your account. 
The second tax bucket or the tax deferred bucket is the tax me later bucket. This bucket holds accounts like traditional IRA, 401k, and SEP IRA. These accounts are funded with a pre-tax money, meaning that you get a, to contribute to these accounts without paying taxes on that money right now. You get an immediate tax advantage and you do not need to claim the contribution as an income in the current year. It's great because it means you we pay less taxes and who does not want that? But of course, Uncle Sam will come knocking. We just want to be sure we are in a lower tax bracket when he is at our door. This is because when you withdraw money from this bucket, your money will be subject to your ordinary income tax bucket. And for many taxpayers living in retirement, this is generally the case. And finally, we have the third tax bucket or the tax-free bucket, which, is, which I like to describe it as never tax me bucket. This bucket holds accounts like Roth IRA, Roth 401k, or Roth 403b and even Coverdell education saving. Your contributions are made with an after-tax money, meaning you do not get a tax deduction for your contributions. However, Uncle Sam won't be visiting you ever as long as you play by the rules. The choice between tax deferred, tax free depends on your future tax implication. And predicting the future tax bucket is challenging, but generally tax deferred accounts are beneficial if future tax rates are lower in the retirement, while the tax free accounts are preferable if rates are higher. And for more, most individuals, it is best to save in all three buckets for flexibility and greater options in the future. For the 2024 tax year, the standard deduction is $29,200 for joint filers, $21,900 for heads of household, and $14,600 for single filers. Many families and individuals will likely take the standard deduction rather itemized. If you took the standard deduction in year 2023, you might want to consider whether bunching charitable contributions and certain expenses like medical expenses and property taxes into one tax year that will allow better itemization. Now let's delve into some of the most common mistakes taxpayers make. When you invest, your custodian will prepare a 1099 form for you every year. Remember, investment accounts contain stocks and mutual funds that may incur realized capital gains throughout the year. They may also receive dividends and other income. You must report these transactions on your tax return. These make up that first tax bucket or the taxable bucket we talked about. Review your tax return. Were there any capital gains or losses reported? And this can be found on Form 1040, Line 7. If so, see Schedule D, Line 13 for capital gain distributions. See Schedule D line 6 and line 14 for short-term and long-term losses carryovers, ensuring that they have been carried over from previous tax returns. One of the most common mistakes we see taxpayers making has to do with backdoor Roth contribution. First, some background information on what these are. A backdoor Roth IRA is a strategy that can help some high earners grow the never tax me bucket that we spoke about earlier. To contribute directly into a Roth IRA, your income needs to be below certain IRS-mandated threshold. So if you make too much money, you cannot contribute to a Roth IRA. If you do not have a Roth 401k option with your retirement plan at work, then your never taxed me bucket may run dry. The good news is that this backdoor Roth strategy can be a loophole for some taxpayers. Here is how it works. You contribute after-tax money to a non-deductible traditional IRA. For year 2023, you can contribute maximum of 6,500 if you are under 50 years old and 7,500 if you are over 50. And you can do this all the way until the tax day. The contribution limits are increased for 2024 to 7,000 if you are under 50 and 8,000 if you are over 50. You then immediately convert or transfer the money from the traditional IRA into a Roth IRA. You need to be very careful. If you violate the IRA aggregation rules, 
this conversion will be taxable. Depending on several factors, however, that may or may not be a big deal, the aggregation rule play a, a crucial role in managing tax treatment related to retirement savings. The IRS treats all the IRA accounts, except for Roth accounts, as a single entity for calculating conversion taxes or minimum distribution. But again, if you follow the rules, it will be tax-free conversion, and you will get your third tax bucket funded in no time. Now, where some taxpayer gets in trouble is failing to report their non-deductible IRA, probably, and we'll delve into that next. One of the most common mistakes we see taxpayers make is not reporting their non-deductible IRA contributions. These contributions must be reported on IRS Form 8606. The custodian does not report this contribution on any form. Just like with QCD, you must inform your accountant about your non-deductible IRA contribution. The Form 8606 helps track your cost basis. It ensures you do not pay additional taxes on your non-deductible contribution when you're converting the balance to your Roth IRA. You must also report your Roth conversion using the custodian's Form 1099-R. A conversion is reportable in the year it is made. So, for example, if you converted your IRA in 2024, then it will be reportable in 2024. This is true even if the contribution you converted was for 2023. And before we move on from here, a few more mistakes we see taxpayers make include uh, not double checking the IRA contribution they made electronically in the current year for the previous year, were coded correctly by the custodian. For example, you can make your 2023 IRA contribution all the way until April 15, 2024. However, if you do not tell the custodian to code it for the previous year, they will code it for year 2024. If you do not catch this mistake, you will end up with uh, what we consider as an excess contribution. You can check for this in your accounts transaction history. Another mistake we see has to do with conversions in general. Some taxpayers will choose to withhold taxes on Roth conversions. The thinking is better pay until Sam now rather than later. However, the portion that you withhold because you pay it to the IRS will incur an early withdrawal penalty of 10% plus income taxes. So for most taxpayers, they do not want to hold taxes on conversions, especially backdoor Roth conversions. And finally, over-contributing to a traditional or a Roth IRA or any retirement account for that matter. It is another common mistake. Luckily, if you discover these mistakes early enough, the IRS does have ways to correct them. This mistake applies to individuals over age 70 and a half and it's one of the most common mistakes taxpayers make. It has to do with the Qualified Cartable Distributions, or QCDs for short. As a refresher, QCDs allow individuals 70 and a half or older to donate directly from their IRA or employer plan to a qualified charity. When you reach a certain age, you are required to take a minimum distribution amount or RMD from your IRA or qualified retirement account. If you do not need this money and you are chartably inclined, you can do a QCD and it will count toward fulfilling your RMD. And even better, it won't be included in your taxable income. When preparing your 2023 Form 1040 or 1040 SR, include on line 4A the total amount of distributions reported on Form 1099R. Then subtract the amount that was transferred directly to the charity and report remainder even if it's zero on line 4B. Write QCD next to line 4B so the IRS knows why the number do not match. And if you itemize your deductions on Schedule A, be sure not to deduct the QCD amount. That would be a double dipping. If an accountant is preparing your tax return, which we recommend, be sure to inform him or her that you did a QCD to satisfy your RMD. Otherwise, they won't know. And make sure to keep a good record of your QCD, especially the confirmation letters they should send you. 
Custodians generally require that you fill out the IRA distribution form to process your QCD. You will include the charity's tax ID, address, and the amount you want to donate. The custodian will process your request directly to the charity, or they will mail the prepaid checks. We recommend this method. A few custodian allows you to use their checking services to do QCD. If you choose this method, you will need to be extra diligent and keep very good records. It will also be your responsibility to ensure that the charity receiving your QCD actually cashes your check before year end. Your custodian will not record any uncashed checks on your 1099R, and you could end up not fulfilling your RMD for the year, which would mean owning 25% penalty to the IRS. The final mistake we are going to discuss is not reporting a recharacterization. I will explain what that means in a minute, but first keep in mind that although recharacterization is not a taxable event, you must report it in your tax return. Now let's go over when you might need to do a recharacterization. Let's say that you decide to open a Roth IRA account and make a maximum contribution of 6,500 for the year 2023 because you are under age 50. You make the full contribution in January only to realize that at the end of the year, you have made too much money to qualify for a Roth IRA. No worries, you can recharacterize your Roth IRA into a traditional IRA but you will need to calculate the earnings attributed to that 6,500 contribution and recharacterize those two. This is essentially means transferring the initial contribution plus earnings to a traditional IRA. If this is done by the due date for filing your tax return, including extensions, you can treat the contribution as made to the second IRA for that year. This means you can ignore your, your mistake. The same thing is true if you contribute to a traditional IRA and then you realize it won't be deductible for your income. Remember that the second tax me later bucket we talked about early? For example, you discover that you or your spouse are covered by a 401k at work, even if you are not participating in it and your income is um, or your income exceeds the IRS uh, threshold. Again, it's important to remember to report your recharacterization, even though it won't be taxable if you corrected it probably. The last bullet point is very important for taxpayers who do Roth conversions to understand. Beginning in 2018, you cannot undo Roth conversions when it's done. That essentially means you cannot recharacterize Roth conversion. This is another reason why we strongly recommend you consult with your accountant to understand the tax ramifications any taxable Roth conversions can have on you personally. Did you roll over retirement funds during the tax year from one account to another, for example, from 401k to an IRA? When you conduct a rollover from an employer plan into an IRA, your custodian will generate a 1099R for you. This event is a tax reportable if you follow the rule is not taxable. Make sure that is treated as a rollover and not taxable distribution by verifying that on form 1040 line 4A or 5A shows the amount of the rollover and in form 1040 line 4B or 5B should be zero if no taxable distribution occurred. Individuals who own charitable lead annuity trusts or CLAT may get confused as to what is required of them during tax time. If you set up a new CLAT in the previous year, you will receive a tax deduction letter, grantor letter, and actuarial statement. You will forward these to your accountant so they can claim your contribution on your personal tax return. Your charitable administrator will file your trusts 1041 and split interest form 5227 most administrators will file the 1041 electronically on your trust's behalf, but you must with signature form 5227 and send that to the IRS yourself. Keep in mind that you should be processing the required distributions from your trust each year, and be sure to note the charity tax identification number in the memo.
and keep record of your distribution so you can forward them to the administrator. We recommend having the charitable administrator of your CLAP take care of your charitable distributions rather than you sending out your own checks. CLATs are subject to many rules, including self-dealing rules, and if you are not familiar with them, you could land in hot water. When you do it yourself, you need to be sure your charity is in good standing with the IRS and that you do not violate the rules. For example, a CLAT distribution cannot be made to your private foundation. You can, however, send your distribution to your donor advice fund. Most accountants act as historians. They tell the IRS everything you have done in the previous year. Your planner's job is to analyze your history to see what can be done in the coming year so that your tax liability is as low as it's possible can be. That is the difference between tax planning and preparing your tax return. No one wants to pay unnecessary and avoidable taxes. Let's take a look at some of the planning opportunities your tax return can uncover for us. By looking at your tax return, we can confirm if you are maximizing all your retirement savings options. Saving in these types of accounts is the most powerful way to save. In that second tax bucket we talked about, or the tax me later bucket, a dollar in taxes saved today, especially when you are in your working years, is compounded so much over the years that it can grow more than a dollar that Uncle Sam deducts taxes from. As we mentioned previously, traditional and Roth IRAs allow annual contribution up to $7,000 with a $1,000 catch up for those over 50 for year 2024. 401ks have $23,000 contribution and often include employer matches. For those over 50, the catch-up contribution is $7,500. Self-employed individuals might consider SIP IRA plans with a $69,000 limit. Higher earners might opt for a defined benefit or cash balance plan, allowing over $300,000 in savings. Oftentimes, a working spouse will overlook their stay-at-home spouse. Contributing to a stay-at-home spouse's IRA or 401k can be a powerful way to help them save for retirement. Your tax return can help us understand your investment history and whether tax loss harvesting makes sense for you. As you will recall from our discussion earlier, long-term capital gains are taxed at a rate of 20%. While short-term capital gains can face maximum tax rate of 37% because they are taxed at ordinary tax rate. Additionally, both are subject to the ACA tax of 3.8% for families with incomes exceeding $250,000. To counteract realized gains, we consider leveraging existing unrealized capital losses. Here is how it works. We start first with short-term assets offsetting realized gains with unrealized losses to establish a net short-term position. This is called tax loss harvesting. Next, we shift focus to long-term investments, reconciling gains and losses for assets held over 12 months. The final step involves consolidating both short-term and long-term consideration. We recognize that losses can directly offset gains with any excess losses up to $3,000 applicable against ordinary income. Any remaining losses beyond this threshold can be carried forward indefinitely for future tax reporting purposes. Be careful though, tax loss harvesting may not always be a good idea. You also want to be careful that you do not mess things up by violating the wash sale rules. This strategy is best done for you by your advisor. Your tax return can help us understand if health savings account or HSA is right for you. If you are enrolled in a high deductible medical insurance plan, contributing to a health saving account or HSA for short can be a valuable saving opportunity as it grows tax deferred. This can be your second and third tax bucket combined. Your contributions are tax deductible, grow tax deferred, and earnings are tax free as long as you follow the IRS rules. In 2024, you can contribute up to $4,150 if you are single or $8,300 if you are, um, have a coverage for your family. 
For HSA users over age 55, you can contribute an additional $1,000 to your HSA. Healthcare expenses in retirement can be significant, with projections estimating cost of $385,000 to $400,000 for a retired couple. HSAs can be a useful way to save for current and future healthcare expenses, as long as you follow the IRS rule. Your tax return is one of the best tools we can use for determining if your Roth conversion may make sense for you. For some taxpayers, paying taxes now to save on taxes later may make sense. Roth conversions have the potential to lower your overall taxable income in the long term, and your money grows in a Roth tax deferred forever and ever. Even when you turn RMD age, you are not required to take out any minimum distributions, therefore it can be passed on to your beneficiaries, who again can benefit from tax-free withdrawals. But again, Roth conversions are not for everyone. There are instances where a Roth conversion does not make sense. It's why we advise you to work with your advisor and accountant to determine if this is sound strategy for your personal situation. Converting a portion of an IRA or Roth IRA is a complex process that involves many moving parts. Unintended consequences can result if the strategy is not properly analyzed or handled, including a possible impact on Medicare premiums two years after the conversion. That's why we recommend working closely with your advisor and accountant to understand all the moving parts. When you give money or property to someone other than your spouse or dependent, you may be required to pay gift tax. The responsibility for paying the tax typically lies with the donor, not the individual receiving the gift. While recipients do not face any immediate tax consequences, they may have to pay capital gain taxes if they sell the gift property in the future. The gift tax do does not play a significant role in the finances for most taxpayers because of two key IRS provisions, the annual gift tax exclusion and the lifetime exemption. For year 2024, up to $18,000 can be gifted without incurring federal gift tax. This means an individual can give up to $18,000 to as many people as he or she wants without having to pay any taxes on the gifts. This amount won't count against your lifetime state and gift tax exclusion either. Let's take this example for 2024 tax year. A grandmother decided to buy her granddaughter a $30,000 car as a college graduation present. Grandma would technically exceed the 2024 the $18,000 exclusion limit by a total of $12,000 but she would not owe additional taxes. That's because she would report the gift to the IRS using Form 709 and deduct $12,000 from her 13.61 million lifetime exemption. As a result, she will still be eligible to give away up to $13,598,000 tax-free. Gifting your money or property while you are alive is an estate planning strategy many families use to give away their wealth. It can not only a tax saving strategy, but it's also a way to see your loved one enjoy hard earned money while you are alive to watch them enjoy it. That concluded today's presentation. If you have any question or you would like to discuss any of the strategies you have learned about today, give us a call. For more information and timely updates, please follow us on social media and visit us at azadasset.com. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. Thanks again.